Matthew chapter 28, we're going to be there in a moment. And don't worry, if you don't have your Bibles, it's going to be on the screen behind me. Uh, but it is Easter Sunday, and I am so excited to be here this morning. Uh, God uh, laid this message that we're going to speak, that I'm going to share with you guys this morning, like, three months ago, two, three months ago, and I have not, I've been just wanting to get it out, and so I am excited uh, for what God has got for us this morning, but we are in God's house this morning celebrating the fact that close to 2,000 years ago, um, Jesus walked out of the tomb. And, and, uh, and we are, because of that, we're going to get into that this morning of what that means for us, and uh, so Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. Verse 6, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb afraid, yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. We serve a God who did not stay dead. We serve a God who is alive and well. Death could not hold our God. Everyone thought Jesus was dead. Everyone. The Romans thought he was dead. His family thought he was dead. Jesus' disciples thought he was dead. His friends, his fa- every single person thought Jesus was dead. The Pharisees, they thought he was gone. Everyone. Everyone thought that Jesus' story ended on a bloody cross, lying naked three days before. But Jesus' story was far from over. And as a result of Jesus' story not being over, our story is not over. Because of the victory that Jesus won when he walked out of that tomb on that Sunday morning, our story goes forward. Our story does not end in death. Without that happening, there is no hope. There is no future. There is no victory for us. Because if Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, what that means is Jesus died for nothing and he was a lunatic. He was a crazy person if he would not have been the Messiah and just died. But the fact that he rose from the dead, it secures our future with him. Now, this is the part of the Sunday morning message where I'm going to veer away a little bit from our East, kind of a traditional Easter Sunday message. Because in scripture, there's a group of people who are mentioned a few times. They are, um, they're, and honestly, depending on which translation you read, you may not even realize who they are. But they're a group that is mentioned uh, quite a bit with the Pharisees and the F- Sadducees, and yet they don't have the notoriety as the first two do. And so uh, if you don't, depending on which translation, you may not even fully realize who they are. We don't really give them much thought. We don't give them much credit. They're kind of an afterthought, uh, but they are a group of people who come from the tribe of Zebulun. They are known as scribes. And in a lot of translations, they are referred to as teachers of the law or experts of the law. Their job description would have been, especially in the Old Testament, to have access into the throne room. And so they would record important conversations by important people that were making important decisions about the future. And they had access to things and to conversations and to information that most people never would have had the opportunity to. Every day they hung out with important people and their one job was to record the conversations that were taking place inside the throne room. A scribe would have a pen 
and a paper, and he would write down what was happening. He was writing down history. He was recording history. He was writing down what other people said. He had a very important job. In the story of Esther, if it wasn't for a scribe who had done his job well, uh, the fate of the Jewish people would have been in peril. If you're not familiar with the story, uh, in, in the book of Esther, uh, Mordecai was Esther's uncle, and he overhears a plot to kill the king, and so he warns the king, and so and, and the king was saved. And so one night, at uh, some point later on, uh, the king is having trouble sleeping. He can't fall asleep, and so he, at, he orders the scribe to come in and read to him because he wants to fall asleep. And so the scribe starts talking and sharing the information, and he tells him the story, reminds him of the story of Mordecai. And the king says, whoa, 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 what was done for Mordecai? And they like, nothing ever was done. You said you would, but you never did. So here's a good reminder for you. So as the story goes, then Mordecai is uh, lifted up and, and put in an exalted place. And as a result, through all of this, the Jewish people are saved. In 2 Kings chapter 25, King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he wipes out Israel. He destroys everything. And during that process, he kills all the king's family. He kills all the generals. He kills all the commanders of the army. He kills the king's inner circle. And Nebuchadnezzar says, oh yeah, kill the chief scribe. Why? Because the chief scribe, he had an ability um, to... King Nebuchadnezzar sees him as a threat because he has of his access. He has the ability to remind people, hey, if God did it for Abraham, he will do it for you. If God did it for Joseph, he will do it for you. If God did it for David and Daniel and Esther and everybody else throughout your, all of our heroes, if God did it for Joshua, he will do it for you as well. And so, King Nebuchadnezzar, the mightiest conqueror the world had ever seen to that point, says, hey, you with the pen and the paper, you are a threat to my culture. You are a threat to my power. And so he has them put to death. The scribes understood the importance of writing things down to remember them tomorrow. So how did these people who posed such a threat to the mightiest conqueror the world had ever seen. How did they go from that to where in Matthew 23, Jesus seven times says, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you scribes. And he calls them hypocrites and a family of snakes, whitewashed tombs, blind guides. How does G- How does the scribes, so a few thousand years ago, Nebuchadnezzar said, kill them because they can impede what I want to do. And now Jesus is saying, woe to you, you Pharisees, you scribes, you blind guides, you hypocrites. How does that happen? Because somewhere along the way, the scribes became more concerned with history than they were about the future. Understand me, guys. The most dangerous place a church can get is where we do more reading than writing. The most dangerous place we can get as a church is where we're always remembering the good times, the old times, where back the way things used to be, instead of writing new stories. As a Christian, the most dangerous place that we can be is when we are remembering, oh, I remember when God did that for me back in the day. I remember how on fire for God I used to be. I remember when God healed me years and years ago and everything that we're remembering is in the past and we, we're more concerned with reciting history of how God used to move than we are about writing our future stories. Our focus cannot be on where we have been, but where we are going. Listen, this is why the scribes in the New Testament were so extremely unpopular with Jesus. Nowhere in in the New Testament do we read about Jesus complimenting them. Nowhere does he give them credit. Nowhere does he give them a shout out or anything like that. You know, he calls them, woe to you, seven times. And what have we talked about? If scripture repeats something time and time and time again, in a short period of time, it's important. So seven times in one chapter, Jesus says, you're a hypocrite. And so Jesus does not like them. He he includes them with a group of people that he spars with all the time, the Pharisees. The scribes 
followed Jesus, and every time he tried to give them a fresh page of miracles, all they could do was compare it to the Old Testament. They would say, like, you can't do that. How dare you heal on the Sabbath? How you, oh, Jesus, no, no, no. You can't do that because this is what the Old Testament, this is what the law of Moses says it has to be. They, they were living where they used to be. And this is not like them. This transition in Judges chapter 4 and 5, we read about a woman, Deborah, leading Israel to victory. And in that story, we read about all the other tribes. They were too busy. Oh, I can't do that. I got stuff to do. Or, oh, I'm scared to death. I don't want to go and fight. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't lose my life. I'm terrified. And here was Zebulon, who Scripture says that they risk their lives fighting for the future. So how do they, how does this happen? There's this transition that doesn't make that doesn't make sense. Because if you fast forward a couple thousand years, the tribe of Zebulon, they settled in the Sea of Galilee along in a little town called Capernaum. Now, guys, listen, I'm building something here, okay? The place where Jesus spends most of his time in ministry. These people who have a gift for writing down what is happening is going to spend three and a half years in the epicenter of the greatest movement that the world has ever seen from God. But instead of bringing their pens and their paper to document all the healings, all the miracles, all all the things that were going on, instead of documenting that, that Jesus was performing, they were too busy carrying that Old Testament law and following Jesus around saying like, The law says you can't heal on the Sabbath. The law says, Jesus, you can't do that. Instead of proclaiming revelation and truth, they are living in yesterday. In Luke chapter four, Jesus walks into the temple and he takes the scroll and he opens it up and he starts reading. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the Lord the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus reads. And then he rolls back up the scroll and says, hey, today, this is taking place. Today, this has happened. And so Jesus, I'm imagining, this is some creative liberties on my part. I'm imagining him writing these things. That, hey, this is what I am the promised Messiah that you've been waiting for for so many years. Here we are. Let's go, fellas. Pick up your pen. Pick up your paper. Let's go write some stories. Let's go write some new stories. This is what we've been waiting for. Come on, guys. Let's go. And they're like, nah, we don't want to. Nah, uh, uh, you would think that somebody who is obsessed with history would want to be responsible for it documenting the future. They're not going to just recite history. They're going to be writing history. They were no longer responsible for just, oh, this is what it used to be. No, no, no. I get to write what's happening now. They have a gift for this kind of thing. They have have the opportunity. These are experts in the law, by the Bible says. So they would have known all the things about the Messiah. They could have looked at Jesus and said, yeah, you fulfilled this prophecy and this prophecy and this one and on and on and on. And eventually say, Hey, you are the Messiah. Let's go. I'm right my pen. I got a whole bunch of papers. Let's go write it. But that's what they did not want to do. They were so caught up in yesterday's history that they miss today's miracles. Instead of being excited about Jesus healing people, they said, no, 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 you can't do that. How dare your disciples, how dare your followers pick corn and heal on the Sabbath? They cannot get past the old way of doing things. They cannot see what is happening because they are so obsessed with the law and the old way of doing things, they can't see the future. Then we get to John chapter 8. Now get ready because I'm finally at the point where I wanted to start this morning, all right? Yeah, you're going to regret cheering when I said more of them and less of me. For those of you that are new, I'm sorry, it's a joke. I'm very sarcastic. It takes you more than 30 minutes to get to know me, okay? Come back next week and the next week and then you'll understand, okay? John chapter eight, we read a story about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Scripture says in the ESV that it was the Pharisees and the scribes 
who catches this woman in the act and bring her to Jesus. I've always had a question though. First of all, how did they know what she was doing? How did they know where she was at? And who was she with? Did they set this woman up? Did they get a call? Was it one of their buddies? Whatever it may be, did they know what was going on? All of a sudden? So they grab this woman, they bring her to Jesus, and they throw her down at his feet. And they say, hey, this woman, she's a sinner. The law says she's finished. The law says she deserves death. The law says we got to stone her because that's what they were obsessed with. But then they ask a really stupid question. You ever asked a stupid question before? Have you ever been asked a stupid question? I know, listen, I know they say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but let's be honest. Sometimes there's some really stupid questions that get asked. I'm not going to recite any of the stupid questions I've been asked or I've asked because I don't want to, anyway, moving on. But these people saved you, Steve. You owe me. They say, this woman, her book is done. Her chapter is over. She deserves death. Then here's a stupid question. They say, what do you say, Jesus? If you don't ask Jesus that question, you don't ask Jesus that question. So Jesus, he gets down in the dirt. He starts writing. He takes the finger the same finger that wrote the law, the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments, and he starts writing. And I don't know what he writes. No clue. And listen, if anybody tells you that they know what Jesus wrote, they're lying to you. Because Scripture doesn't say. But this is what my thing, this is what I think may have happened. He gets down on his knees and he starts writing. And this is what I think he writes. I think he says, you say her story is over. You say she deserves death. You say that it's finished for her. But I say her story isn't over. I say the story is going to continue on. You put a period. I'm putting a comma. I'm saying she is not done. I'm saying it's not over. Listen, if you ever find a really dirty, rotten sinner and you want to punish him, don't take him to Jesus. Don't. Take him, take him to a self righteous, hypocritical, self-important pastor or church or board. Find that old crusty curmudgeon who loves to punish people and point their finger and say, how dare you do that? Find you one of those because if you take them to Jesus, this is what Jesus is going to say. Her story, his story, it's not over. I'm going to write you a new story. I can deliver you from whatever you are going through. Whatever you've gone through, I say it's not over. Jesus writes a new story and Jesus is not afraid to get down in the dirt and write that story for us. I am so glad that Jesus wrote my name out of the book of the law and wrote my name into the Lamb's book of life because my story would have been over and finished according to the scholars, according to the experts. But Jesus said, no, 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 your story's not over. On that good Friday, close to 2,000 years ago, the enemy said, Jesus is finished. He's done. The, the Pharisees, the scribes, all the experts, all the religious, you know, elite, they say his story is done. The enemy says his story is done. And as a result, guess what? Your story is over and your story is over and your story is over and your story is over. They thought it was done. They thought they had won. But then Sunday morning happens and Jesus walks out of that tomb. He said, his story, my story's not over. You think it's over, but it's not. And so as a result of that, guess what? My story and your story and our story is not over because Jesus says it's not over over. The scribes say it's over. Jesus' story was not finished at the cross. It was merely part of the story. The enemy puts a period there and Jesus is like, no, no, make a comma. Let's make a semicolon. Let's make a hyphen. Like, let's extend this sentence. Let's extend this story. And because Jesus gets a comma, we get a comma. Listen, hear me on this. There's another chapter coming to your addiction, to your divorce, to your abuse, to your past mistakes. The, descri the scribes say you are finished. The religious experts say you are finished, that you deserve death, but not Jesus. Jesus said that he comes to bring new life, to bring a new chapter. Because here's the thing, hear me. You are not your divorce. 
You are not your porn addiction. You are not your drug addiction. You are not your past abortion. You are not your past felony. You are not the person who was abused and thrown away. You are not your past sexual sins. You are not your bankruptcy. You are not your alcoholic father or your abusive mother. You are not just an unplanned pregnancy. You are not your past shame. Hear me when I say this. You are not a mistake. The religious hypocrites say your story is finished, but Jesus walked out of the tomb and said, hey, it's not over for you. I'm giving you another chance. I'm going to give you your second or your third or your fifth or your 10th or your 20th chance. I'm going to give it to you. Your story is not finished. You are not your past. When you accept Jesus as your savior, you are now a child of the king. Jesus walked out of that tomb and he puts a comma where everybody else puts a period. He won victory over death and secured our future to all those who accept him. Scripture says that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, I'm kind of a, you know, I've got a degree, a Bible degree, and, you know, I've got, I went to Bible school, and so I'm kind of smart when it comes to this stuff. And I did a word study this week on whosoever. Did, really got in depth. Took me all of one second to figure this out. Whosoever means whosoever. There's no, listen, I know, listen, I know, I know this is high level stuff. This is what you pay me the big bucks for, okay? To figure out what the word whosoever means. So there's no, Jesus does not put any kind of restrictions on whosoever. He doesn't say, well, whosoever, but you, you can't. You know, no, no, he said, whosoever accepts me. It does not matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you've done. It does not matter what all the bad things that you've done. He said, I don't care. As long as you believe in me, I can set you free. Religious experts and legalistic self-important people might tell you that you deserve death, that you deserve punishment, that you don't deserve all those chances, but not Jesus. Jesus walked out of that tomb for you. His victory is your victory. His victory is our victory. Jesus's final chapter did not end on a Friday. It was not his last story. And whatever you are going through this morning, understand me and hear me when I say this, it is not your final chapter. As long as you are still breathing, as long as you have Jesus, it is not your final chapter. They thought it was done for him, but it wasn't. It's not done for you either. God is still writing your story. All is not done. Worship team, if you'll come up. Your story isn't finished. All we have to do, all you have to do is to accept his free offer of salvation. That period in your life, it turns into a comma when you accept Jesus as your savior. Scripture says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is that simple. And anybody who tries to overcomplicate it or tells you, hey, you got to clean up your life before you come to Jesus, they're liars. They're liars. And I don't care if it was your mama or your daddy or your pa or their pastor or whatever it may be that told you, they are lying to you because Jesus says, whosoever. Will you stand with me this morning? Many people, they live where God and what God used to do. And they fail to realize God is still writing. Do not put a period where God puts a comma. My favorite, one of my top two or three favorite sayings is what? The best is yet to come. Do you know what? I'm going to share why I love saying that. It's not because I think our history or our past is bad. It's incredible. I had a conversation with somebody this week about some of our past and the fact that all the pushback that Pastor Gene and Sister Carolyn got, like, you'll never pay that building off. Ha <laughs> ha! We did. I got, the, I got the burned ashes in my office to prove it. Well, you'll you can never make a church like that work. Listen, hey, 
It's not because I'm trying to belittle all the miracles and the healings and the miraculous things that took place. It's, I'm not trying to eliminate that part of the story. I'm trying to keep us focused forward on what comes next. Yes, what has happened the past 20 and 30 years has been incredible, but what God is going to do in the next 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 years is going to be incredible as well. We have always got to be looking forward and not looking past. We have to make sure that we don't become this self-important, legalistic, well, Jesus, why do you can't heal on the Sabbath? Jesus can do whatever Jesus wants to do. He doesn't need your permission. He doesn't need my permission. It's good to remember what God has done for us in the past because, yes, if God did it for Moses, he can do it for us as well. But we cannot live in that space. The best is yet to come because we are not resting on the way things used to be, but we are striving for that next great move of God. I was in here yesterday praying for today. I was like, God, send it here. You got, if you're going to move, Move here. You, Windsor, Missouri, use us, God. Let us be ready for that because I don't want to live on what God used to do. I don't want to live on my past stories. God is still writing. I don't want to ever get to the point where, like, Jesus, you can't do that because this is the way you used to do it. If I ever say that, smack me. Truthfully, once again, some of you are way too anxious to do that. I got to bring you guys back now. We're serious. If you came here this morning searching for something to fill a hole in your life and you tried to fill it with everything else, you've tried filling it with whatever else may be independent, independent and apart from God, I've got good news for you. That can change this morning. You are here for a reason. I know you may think, well, I'm only here because my mom dragged me here. I'm only here because my, my wife or my husband drug me here. I'm only here because my grandma drug me here. No, no, no. I don't believe in that. I believe that it was God who was drawing you into us this morning. Jesus cares about you, and he wants to take that period in your story, wipe it away, put a comma, because you are not your past. That woman with the caught in the act of adultery, said, she deserves death. What do you say, Jesus? Jesus said, no, she deserves life. She deserves an opportunity. And that's what he's telling us. We don't, de- Jesus, we did deserve death. But Jesus took that punishment and that judgment on the cross on Friday. He took it. By his stripes, we are healed. That We sing that, but I can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And listen, I know if you're a first-time person in church, you're like, that is gross. I am not taking the blood in Jesus' bath. I get it. It's a metaphor, okay? We're not literally going to drink blood of Jesus, all right? We're not going to wash you in the blood, okay? But because Jesus did that, we can have relationship with him. And what he did on Sunday morning, it cemented everything. He said, I am God. I can. I am stronger than death. And I want you to experience the same victory that I've experienced. We all, whosoever means what? Whosoever. You are not limited by that. So just a moment, I'm going to ask you guys to answer a very important question. I want you to remember, whosoever means whosoever. Forget the past. Anybody that tells you your past disqualifies them, have them come talk to me and I will set them straight. I promise you. Because we will not have Pharisee, scribe, legalistic people around this place. Because whosoever means whosoever. As you leave here today, if you feel like maybe you've been freed from some of the shame or your past, or you feel encouraged or empowered to go forward, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, okay? I'm going to give you a play-by-play. A little bit later today, something is going to come at you. And they're going to try to convince you that what you experienced this morning was not real. Okay? Maybe it's a an old friend, an old relationship that just pops up out of the blue. Listen, I, I can tell you this because I've experienced this. Last week, we had a great day, right? A thousand people at our church. Awesome day. I didn't get home before it was like, like oh, devil, you're good, but you're not that good. So he's gonna, you're gonna run into some legal beagle Christian. Is like, wait, you can't. No, whosoever, whosoever. 
So you do not allow the enemy into your head, into your life, into your thoughts, and convince you that you are not a part of whosoever. Jesus says, your story isn't over. The Pharisees and the scribes says, stoner. And Jesus said, nah, I'm going to bring you life. I'm going to bring it to you more abundantly. I'm going to choose to believe that part of it. I'm going to believe Jesus over the people who can't get past what happened 5,000 years ago. The law said you can't do that. Jesus is the law. He, is, he writes the law. And he says, if I'm going to heal you, I can heal you if I want to. So don't let that happen. Be prepared for it. I promise you it's going to happen. If it's not by before you're done with lunch, it might be before you go to bed. If it's not before you... Some point soon, you're going to receive an attack. You ignore it, push it out of your head, and say, no, my story isn't over. Just when Jesus walked out of that tomb, his story wasn't over, and as a result, our story isn't over. And that is what we are celebrating today. Victory with what he did on that Sunday morning. I love this church. The best is yet to come. I believe that with all my heart. I hope you have the best week you have ever had in your entire life. Pastor Regina, we pray so. Lord, we are so grateful for what you did for us years ago that, Lord, enables us to continue our story. Lord, it, it enables us to take a new step and a new walk and a, and a new life every single day, Lord, that we come to you. And I'm so thankful for that. Lord, we ask that as we go our ways today and as we go to celebrate and have family lunch and things, Lord, that your presence would be upon each and every one and they would be felt throughout this day. Lord, those that receive victory today, they would continue to fight for that victory in your name. And we know that you are able to do all things. Lord, bless each heart, bless each family. Lord, bless each and every one, Lord, and let them know you are real today on Resurrection Sunday. And we ask that you would be glorified in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.